They live on the razor's edge of both science and survival. No lush tropical rainforest for these chimps. But the harsher landscape, where the forest gives way to patchy woodlands and sizzling savanna. It's a landscape much like the one where our earliest ancestors may have taken their first steps, literally, toward being human. And these chimps are doing remarkable things. Enjoying an afternoon dip, taking refuge in caves, and now hunting mammals with spears. What can they tell us about our origins and about ourselves? After the dramatic rescue of a kidnapped infant, anthropologist Jill Preetz and her groundbreaking chimps are rewriting the book on what it means to be an ape and what it means to be human. It's approaching noon in the patchy woodlands of Senegal, West Africa. The temperatures are reaching 45 degrees Celsius in the shade. This is a place no primate in its right mind, chimp or human, would choose to live. But these guys don't have a choice. And perhaps neither did our ancestors. So anthropologist Jill Preetz has been up since before dawn, patiently following some of the most intriguing primates in the world, as she has been doing for nine years now. These chimps can barely turn around without creating a stir. Well, the whole reason that I chose Fungoli as a study site is because it is so different from any other site where chimps have been habituated. You get tiny little patches of forest, so it's really woodland and grassland. And so I knew that there would be significant differences in chimp behavior, but I would never have predicted some of the differences that we see. Some of the things Jill has seen here have been shaking up both the study of chimps and the study of our earliest human ancestors, or hominids. It all starts some five to seven million years ago, when the world was cooling, drying, forcing the vast rainforests of Central Africa into retreat. In places, the shadowy creature that gave rise to both chimps and humans, our last common ancestor, faced a choice, retreat with the thick rainforests, or master a harsher life where the forest thinned out, a place like this. Over the eons, they went their separate ways, one eventually on its knuckles, the other, for reasons that are a matter of raging controversy, standing up. And the chimps here do things chimps just aren't expected to do, like taking refuge in caves. Only rarely have chimps been seen in caves, but here in Fongoli, it's a regular thing. It's about six degrees Celsius cooler than even in the shade of the woods. On the edge of survival here in Fongoli, six degrees makes all the difference. You can tell a lot from sitting at the mouth of a cave about what's going on in the Fongoli chimp community at that time. You can predict that, for example, when the dominant male, Yopokan, comes, he's going to display until he gets himself a place in the cave. And you'll see huge fights where Lupin, who's an up-and-coming male, will do displays and actually throw something into the cave. And a number of males will come out.
The scene may call to mind B-movie imaginings of how our eight-man ancestors lived through the ages. But there may be a serious lesson to be learned about ourselves here. It shows how significant the environment can be in terms of ape behavior and this type of environment. And also I think it's, it's interesting to people because it's sort of reminiscent of perhaps early humans. You think of, you know, cave use and perhaps the first shelters were caves. With the commotion over, a mother and her daughter prepare for a siesta in the cave. That they are both alive and together is pretty much a miracle. Amy, about a year old now, plays with sticks while mom, Tia, rests. But this peaceful mother-daughter scene seemed all but impossible after the terrifying events of months ago. It all started at the beginning of 2009 with Jill's worst nightmare. Her project manager had spotted a baby chimp in the local town, perhaps destined for the pet trade. By the time a panicked Jill raced back to Fangoli from the US, her team had managed to convince the locals to give the baby back. Jill and the team were determined to reintroduce the baby to the wild. But that would only be possible if the mother was alive. And usually, mothers are killed when babies are taken. Jill had to find the chimps, and fast. I was walking actually not far from here, and I didn't hear the chimps, but all of a sudden, I saw a Carmoco walking across the road, and it was the greatest thing I could imagine. And, and so I radioed Johnny. I said, the chimps are here. And right after that, I saw that Tia was there with no baby. It was only then that she knew the baby was Amy and that there was real hope. They quickly retrieved the infant and headed back to the chimps. They placed the baby in a bag and carried her as close as they thought they could safely get to a fig tree where the chimps were feeding. Finally, a remarkable young orphan named Mike noticed them. Mike is very curious, and he likes to watch people, I think, more than some of the other chimps. And so he saw us, and he was watching us. And so we backed away, and the baby just sat in the bag. And then pretty soon, Mike comes up the hill. 